Welcome to today's webinar on rumen biohydrogenation and milk fat yield in dairy cows. My name is Mark Scott, and I'm the Director of Research and Development for Milk Specialties Global, where I oversee the Innovation and Research Program for the Animal Nutrition Division. I'm going to start the webinar today by providing a brief overview of Milk Specialties Global. Then Dr. Kevin Harvatin will present his insights on biohydrogenation and milk fat yield. After his presentation, there will be a brief Q&A session, and then we will conclude the webinar. Milk Specialties Global was founded in 1944, focused on weight processing and milk replacer nutrition. We continued to expand our core competencies into fatty acid nutrition in 1989, while becoming the largest producer of whey protein in North America in 2014. More recently, milk specialties has moved forward into areas such as extrusion and whey-based bioactive molecules. Milk specialties is a leader in protein production, and our business has three areas of focus. Those areas are human nutrition, animal nutrition, and contract manufacturing. Our facility network consists of four animal nutrition plants located in the Midwest, along with eight human nutrition plants located across the U.S. Our headquarters is based in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. Milk Specialties has positioned itself as a customer and manufacturer of dairy ingredients. We are focused on nourishing generations of both animals and humans around the globe. Milk Specialties offers science-based solutions with proven nutritional benefits. The foundation of our science starts with our R&D laboratory and farms and extends to top universities in North America. Our products consist of bypass fats, milk replacer, protein encapsulated fats, and rumen-protected ingredients. With years of research and on-farm results, Milk Specialties has positioned itself as the market leader in bypass fats to keep dairy cows healthy and performing at their peak. Without further ado, let me introduce our main speaker today. Dr. Kevin Harvatine is an Associate Professor of Nutritional Physiology at Penn State University. He earned his bachelor's degree from Penn State University's master's degree from Michigan State University and PhD from Cornell University. Dr. Harvatine is focused on nutritional regulation of metabolism and is currently investigating milk fat depression, fat supplements, and daily patterns of intake and milk synthesis. During the presentation today, if you have any questions or comments, please record them using the Q&A feature, and we will answer them after the presentation. Dr. Harvatine, welcome. Hello, I'm Kevin Harvatine from Penn State University. Today, I wanted to talk about rumen biohydrogenation in, in milk fat yield. It's really interesting that, that we have a situation where we have a lot of things we have to think about to optimize fat yield energy intake and milk yield. And a lot of it, we don't have great data on what's going on, on in the rumen. So I want to kind of point you in a few directions and talk through some things that I think you should have on your mind. I keep saying that fatty acid nutrition keeps getting more and more interesting. So just as soon as I think that we sort of have things worked out, uh, something new pops up and we're off again looking for, for uh, uh, new ways to use the knowledge, but it also continues to be more and more challenging. So I wanted to kind of seed with a, a couple of things to keep in mind as we go through our discussion today. And that's that we know and have known for a long time that dietary unsaturated fatty acids increase risk for milk fat depression. So that's a challenge to make optimal use of rumen available fat sources and a really big issue that we cannot have diet-induced milk fat depression or we're not going to have optimal milk, milk fat yield. So 
we know dietary fatty acid supply impacts milk fat yield. That's both total fatty acids and palmitic acid, but we don't have great numbers for exactly how much we need to provide. And it's probably because it's dynamic and it depends on the cow in, in the situation. Now there's new data giving interest to oleic acid in its ability to increase fatty acid digestibility and possibly also change metabolism. A lot of interesting possibilities around adipose tissue metabolism. The problem is it's difficult to predict 18-1 flow to the duodenum. So overall, we have interesting biology and a lot of great opportunities to make use of, but we really lack model predictions of rumen biohydrogenation to easily do this within our ration balancing approaches. So the analogy I like to use is that we have a lot of experience on amino acid supplementation and balancing, right? So if you think about our approach there, we use the, a model to predict the dietary supply of lysine or methionine. And then we pick our supplements and we feed those supplements in a way to complement that diet to reach our targets for duodenal or absorbed, I guess we would actually be absorbed, uh, methionine and lysine. So if we come back to our fatty acid analogy, we don't have good model predictions of rumen biohydrogenation. So we don't really know what our basal diets are providing for these fatty acids that we have interest in. So now we talk a lot about finding supplements to provide these fatty acids, but we really need to step back and think about how we pick those supplements to complement our basal diet. And that's where we need to have a more in-depth discussion of fatty acid biohydrogenation. I wanted to really quickly talk about uh, milk fat and the importance of, of milk fat and variability in milk fat on farms. I always like showing the data on the cash flow coming from a cow making 85 pounds of milk, 3.9 fat, 3.1 protein. And you can see it's predominantly the blue and red lines coming from milk fat and protein. Uh, other solids you're not being very paid very much for. So our goal in ration balancing and managing herds needs to be to maximize fat and protein yield. I've now started saying I think we should also try to be trying to be average fat and protein concentration. And that's because it's expensive to make additional lactose. It's expensive to ship. We need to both maximize yield, but also make sure we're not hurting ourselves as far as um, uh, losing some concentration. Milk fat and protein concentration have been increasing over time. We're showing here the 12 month running average for Northeast milk market in Florida. Um, and you can see the Northeast has been on a linear increase in milk fat concentration since 2010. If we look at all the other milk markets, we'd see a similar pattern. I like using the Northeast milk market because we haven't had so much of an increase in Jersey and crossbred herds. So what's going on in Florida? Florida is also mostly Holstein herd but you can see that they have not been increasing. And I think what this demonstrates is that the environmental impact, that our cows have the potential to make more milk fat, but if we don't have the good quality forages, good environmental conditions, that we can limit their production. So this is the opportunity as a nutritionist and consultant is to make sure we're not having those, those limitations. So what is the big driver of this? Well, part of this is genetic potential. So just just showing that over uh, you know decades going back to 1980 we've been on a linear increase in milk fat yield, but up until 10 years ago most of that was driven by breeding for increased milk yield. Now in the last 10 years they've changed the equations in they're selecting more for increased milk fat percent. So genetic potential is up 0.3 units in the past 10 years. We also have a seasonal pattern, and I always like to, to, to mention this, um, that you have about 0.25 units of milk fat, 0.2 units of milk protein, highest milk fat and protein January 1, lowest fat and protein July 1. You need to keep this in mind to accurately and precisely set your goal. Your goal should be different in January than it is in July. So what should you be thinking about to maximize milk fat yield? The first is we need to set our goal 
we need to take into account that seasonal pattern. I think it's also interesting to look at the genetics. We do not see much genetic potential difference between herds, even though there's a large genetic difference between cows within, within a herd. But we definitely need to take these things into account, especially that seasonal pattern, to be able to say exactly how much do we expect uh, from that, that herd. Next, we need to balance our diet. We'll talk about unsaturated fatty acids and fermentability being really key to milk fat depression. Also, fiber digestibility is important to acetate supply, and we've shown that acetate is important to milk fat yield. There's data showing fat supply is also important, specifically palmitic acid is a big driver there, and also some individual feed additives that can reduce our risk for milk fat depression. So a lot of things we can do as nutritionists to work on um, making sure we're not hurting ourselves with milk fat depression and providing the nutrients the cow needs to make milk fat. Next thing we need to do is manage the feeding system because even though that TMR is mixed and every bite's the same, if that cow is eating a lot at once, that's creating a slug feeding situation and can really disrupt rumen fermentation. And then the last is we need to monitor and adjust and basically let the cows tell us if what we're doing is working um, working for them, right? So milk fat concentration is the obvious one. Um, we should be plotting out and following milk fat yield also. Uh, we can use de novo and trans 10 18 one fatty acids, and I'll show a little bit of that data. And then also have in mind your time course. So I won't show this data today, but what we've seen is that for diet-induced milk fat depression, you expect changes to occur over seven to 10 days. We don't have as, as high resolution time courses for fat supplements, but I would guess that they are going to occur even faster than seven days. If you have a limitation dietary fat supply, I think the cow is going to make use of those additional fatty acids well within seven days. So how do we economically maximize milk fat yield? So our goal here is, is, is to, to increase a profit, right? So if we have to have, we have high feed costs, we have to think about how do we um, uh, make good choices. We can spend some money because there's value in milk fat, but we wanna make some good choices and make sure that, that they're paying for themselves, right? The first thing we need to do is minimize milk fat depression. You cannot have milk fat depression and, and have optimal milk fat yield. You're just, just shooting yourself in the foot, right? So a big thing there is too much 18.2 uh, and polyunsaturated fatty acids in general, but 18.2 is probably two to three times as much of an issue as, as 18.1. The diagram here, I'm showing a little bit of that in the rumen, we have 18.1 and 18.2 are both biohydrogenated. And that, if that goes to completion, we get steric acid. 18.2, we normally are going through a trans-11 pathway. That's fine. We'll have normal milk fat. If we shift the microbial population, we get trans-10 and trans-10 intermediates that cause milk fat depression. The oleic acid can make some trans fatty acids, but it does not make the bioactive trans fatty acids. So what we often think of is a, kind of sort of a double whammy with 18.2. It's both a a, has an impact on the microbial population and it's addi applying additional stress to this biohydrogenation pathway and in increasing the chance that we get those trans-10 intermediates. So that's a big part of this is thinking about the amount of polyunsaturated fatty acids, especially 18.2. We also have to think about other risk factors, go into that a little bit more coming up, but things like fermentability, anything that throws off normal rumen fermentation. At the same time, we need fat to make milk fat. So 55% of milk fatty acids are coming from preformed fatty acids. The cow has some ability to compensate for that if she has acetate and nutrients available to make those fatty, de novo fatty acids. Um, this is where we, we there probably is a requirement or an optimal amount of dietary fat to provide to a cow to, to have optimal milk fat yield. But it's probably not a single number. It's probably dynamic relative to, again, that cow's ability to make up for uh, a shortage through that de novo synthesis. 
palmitic acid increases milk fat the most, but there's certainly a lot of examples in the literature where blends of 18 and 16 carbon fatty acids or other oil seeds resulted in an increase in milk, milk fat. I always talk about there's a continuum from high to low milk fat. So maximal milk fat yield, we're, we probably are not maximizing, or sorry, max, maximal milk fat percent. We're probably not maximizing milk fat yield because we're probably giving up some energy intake in losing some milk yield in those diets. We start adding, adding risk factors to the diet. It increases energy intake, gets us a little bit more milk. Uh, and that's all fine. We start slowing the trans-11 pathway. What we don't want to do is get to the point where we shift to that trans-10 pathway because then we're going to start getting milk fat depression. So think of each herd as being somewhere along this continuum. Each cow within the herd is somewhere along that continuum. And this is important to keep in mind because when you make a diet change, if you're already pretty close to the shift, you, can, you could add one more risk factor and now you've caused milk fat depression is sort of that straw that breaks the camel's back. So you just need to be, be careful and kind of keep in mind, where is this herd? Are they really safe or are they getting towards the edge? So how do we know how close to the edge we are? Well, the best way to do this is through milk trans 10, 18, 1. This has to be done by GC with the 100 meter column. Uh, so it is a slow technique and it's an expensive technique. It is commercially available from, from some labs now. Uh, we did a meta-analysis a couple years ago and showing the data here. And there's a nice relationship between milk fat percent and trans 10, um, 18.1. You know, there's a lot of variation in this figure, but this is a challenging technique in labs across the world that have published on it, right? In my numbers, so normal milk fat, we're looking at a 0.3 to 0.5. Uh, when we get to a 0.6 to a, to 1%, we're getting some, some degree of milk fat depression. And I need to adjust this that now that we're at a 4.0 average, at 0.6 to 1%, we're probably a 3.7 to a 3.5% milk fat. You go to severe milk fat depression, you get very high trans 18 ones. So very specific for the biology of what's going on. Again, it's expensive, it's slow, so we're not going to have this uh, on a routine basis. The, the number that you probably have easier access to, not probably, definitely have easier access to, is de novo fatty acids. So these are those fatty acids less than 16 carbons in length. And when we get diet-induced milk fat depression, we decrease those short-chain fatty acids. Showing data from my lab on the right, where we have an R squared of 0.6, between milk fat and de novo synthesized fatty acids when we've caused diet-induced milk fat depression. So reasonable relationship there, right? But if we look at the left, this is the literature, and now we only have an, an R squared of 0.16 between milk fat and de novo fatty acids. So why is that? Well, it's not just milk fat depression that decreases de novo fatty acids. There's a lot of other things. So just feeding an additional fat supplement in the diet will decrease de novos because the mammary gland is able to take up preformed fatty acids and says, I'm going to use those rather than making fatty acids from, from scratch. So we have to be a little bit careful. Really good number to watch, but you'd want to watch it within a herd. And you, you're going to expect this to change for, for a number of different reasons. So diet-induced milk fat depression is caused by a lot of different risk factors. Top of the list is rumen unsaturated fatty acids. Again, 18.2 is more of an issue than 18.1 or 18.3. Diet fermentability, anything that causes a disruption in normal rumen fermentation can be a risk factor there. So I've been told that diet-induced milk fat depression is not a problem anymore. Is, is this true? Um, and, and if you think through some of the possibilities of why diet-induced milk fat depression might not be as prevalent, I think there's, there's some good reasons that we could be reducing prevalence. The first is that we've lowered risk factors, and I think that's true. We have lower fat to sore grains, better forages, uh, higher forage diets, better feed management. You know, We've learned a lot about milk fat depression, both in academia and 
getting that out in a, in in Dr. Jenkins um, did a did a lot of discussions about this. So so maybe we've all listened and we know how to stay away from the problem. I think we are getting better about dealing with it. Uh, we've selected cows that are more resistant to milk fat depression. I think that's also true. The geneticists are just selecting for fat yield. They don't know why that cow has higher fat yield. We're probably selecting for cows that just in their feeding behavior and how their rumen functions have lower susceptibility to milk fat depression. But then the last one is, I question, are we missing diet-induced milk fat depression because we have not adequately adjusted to the new genetic potential? Uh, and I think that's probably happening. So when you were expecting a 3.7, if you're at a 3.4, you were jumping up and down out of milk fat depression. Now, when you're expecting a 4.0, if you're at a 3.7, are you jumping up and down saying, we have a problem, we better fix it fast? It's a little bit harder to do, right? We need to, to make that adjustment, but our cows have changed. So I don't know. I imagine it's a little bit of all of these, but I think we can't stop increasing our goals and expectations. And our challenge that I think there's we are probably missing some mild cases of milk fat depression just because we haven't changed our goals. So I wanted to, to talk a little bit about rumen biohydrogenation because this is really key both to diet-induced milk fat depression, but also if you're trying to target a certain um, amount of 18-1 hitting, or the cis-9, 18-1 oleic acid hitting the duodenum. So to start out, I think a really good place is looking at this meta-analysis by Glosser in 2008. Now, I will say that there's not a lot of duodenal omasal flow data out there, right? Uh, so it's a limited database, but it's it's a reasonable database. So he was just looking at in, in a normal diet, in the average diet in the literature, what uh, how much of intake is is escaping the rumen? So for oleic acid, 24% of intake was hitting the duodenum. That's 76% biohydrogenation. 18.2, 5% of intake. 18.3, 4% of intake. So that's 95 and 96% of biohydrogenation. 95. 96% biohydrogenation. So you can see biohydrogenation is really extensive. It looks that oleic acid is, has lower biohydrogenation than 18.2 and 18.3. Um, I get a little bit worried about this because it's also analytically harder to separate 18.1, and some of these older papers may have had some trans fatty acids in their 18.1 peaks, um, but, but I think our global picture is, is, is probably reasonable here, just maybe not get hung up on, on the, the exact numbers, right? So I wanted to talk through what we need to think about for rumen metabolism of unsaturated fatty acids. So most of our fatty acids in the diet are esterified. So everything in our oil seeds um, and our corn grain, things like that, that fatty acids are esterified. That comes into the rumen. Microbes have a lot of lipase enzymes. We get a hydrolysis to free fatty acids. Very rapid um, process. We, we actually expect this to be um, uh, you know, almost immediate, very, very high activity of hydrolysis. We have free fatty acids that would be both in our prills, but also some free fatty acids and silages from that fermentation process. They enter the rumen as free fatty acids. Calcium salts of fatty acids come into the rumen as calcium salt. They can dissociate into a free fatty acid. Now, if the if it's an unsaturated fatty acid, it can be biohydrogenated, going through that trans fatty acids to saturated fat. And of course, everything in the rumen is available for passage. But the question of if it's going to pass is just dependent on the rate of that passage relative to the rate of biohydrogenation, or in the calcium salt case, the release to that free fatty acid than biohydrogenation. So we need to think both about the rate availability, biohydrogenation rate, and rumen retention time. So the other thing is that we need to recognize that not all fatty acids in the rumen are available, right? So this diagram just takes us that one step further to realize that when a feed enters the rumen, you could think of a fatty acid that's in a cotton seed that fatty acid is not available to the microbe until that cottonseed is broken apart and that fatty acid is released from the cottonseed. 
So we have this big pool of rumen unavailable fatty acid. It becomes available to the microbes, and then we have biohydrogenation that can occur of that available pool. So now we're kind of breaking this apart. We need to think about the rate of release of fatty acids in the rumen and that rate of biohydrogenation as two separate events. So to get some numbers for this, we recently developed a, an in vivo biohydrogenation assay. So we wanted to do this in vivo because uh, rates of biohydrogenation and rates of microbial fermentation can be very different in vivo versus in vitro, right? So our approach here is that we take a rumen cannulated cow and we bolus dose in an oil enriched in unsaturated fatty acids and a small amount of a saturated odd chain fatty acid. So here we're showing 17O. So 17O is very low in the rumen and it can't be biohydrogenated. It's only leaving rumen by, by passage. Our unsaturated fatty acids leaving the rumen both by passage, but also by biohydrogenation. So what we do is we bolus this into the rumen, we take samples over time, and we look for disappearance of these fatty acids from the rumen. If we assume that the passage rate of 17O is the same as 18.3, we can then calculate biohydrogenation rates by difference. So total disappearance of the unsaturated fatty acid minus the passage rate of 17O would give us the biohydrogenation rate. So to show you what this data looks like, we have um, uh, enrichments in green, we've, we've bolused 18.3 in blue 18.1 and in red 18.2. You can see that we're not getting nice enrichments. These, this is what we'd call a perturbation model. So we've enriched the pool and then we're going to watch it go back to baseline. And then we do an exponential curve fit to, to get our rates. The rates that I'm showing here are where, where we've looked at that total disappearance and subtracted off the passage rate of the odd chain saturated fatty acid. So 18.3 is biohydrogenated at 87% per hour, 18.2, 53% per hour, cis 9, 18.1 at 44% per hour. If you calculate based on the biohydrogenation rate and the passage rate, the extent of biohydrogenation we get as we expect 80 to 90% biohydrogenation. So we want to make sure that this, this, this was actually in three separate experiments. We did each oil as a separate experiment. We wanted to directly compare rates in the same experiment. So we repeated this and published it this year. And we got very similar numbers. So 73% for 18.3, 57% for 18.2, 47% for 18.1. So I don't want to get, have you get too hung up with 18.3 being a higher rate than 18.1 and 18.2. Um, the reality is these are all extremely high rates, right? So we're putting an oil in, we're expecting that a lot of that oil is available right away, if, if not all of it, right? So what we're looking at is the, the, the rate of the micro being able to metabolize in that first step of biohydrogenation. And we see it is very, very fast. It doesn't matter if it's 50% or 70%, it is extremely fast, right? Uh, so what's the application of this? What it's changed my thinking the most is that this rate is so fast, it's not what's limiting biohydrogenation. What's limiting biohydrogenation is actually the rate of availability of that unsaturated fatty acid in the rumen. So if we think about that uh, cotton seed with that fatty acid stuck inside, the rate of it coming out of the seed is much, much slower than this rate of biohydrogenation. So that's where we need to do put our thinking in our in our kind of modeling um, I, that we have to do in our head because the model's not doing it. We have to think about that form in the processing uh, that's going to be important to, to that availability. So when what impacts the rate of uh, fatty acid availability? Uh, for forages, the rate of cell wall breakdown, basically rate of digestion is, I think, our best bet there. Oil seeds, type of seed, so cotton seed is going to be probably our slowest. Grinding and processing, so the more we grind soybeans, we know they're more rapidly available in the rumen. Byproducts are going to be variable depending what it is. The store grains that a lot of that oil is on the outside, uh, and that's rapidly available. 
Now they are pulling more of the oil out of these processes to sell as biofuels. So that's a, a, a bit of a changing, changing deal there. Calcium salts, so that calcium salt, uh, that calcium will will release from the fatty acid. That's going to depend on the pKa of the fatty acid and rumen pH. And this does occur within the pH of the rumen. Part of that calcium salt is going to be dissociated uh, for 18.1 and 18.2, right? So it's not it's not 100% bound. It's not making it all to the albumasum. There's some availability there. For fatty acid prill, uh, we really don't know, but um, I, you know, we don't have a lot of unsaturated fatty acids in those prills. But my guess is that there, there's a slow release there because that unsaturated fat is coated with that mm -hmm. that saturated fat. So the the so we've talked about that rate of biohydrogenation. So the other part of this is the passage rate, right? So how long do the microbes have to do their work? both from the breakdown and release of that fatty acid in the room, but also the biohydrogenation part. So there's not a lot of work on this. This is going back to my master's with Mike Allen. We had a control diet that had 10% cottonseed. Energy Booster 100 is our saturated fat. And then we titrated, replacing for calcium salt in this calcium salt uh, was a combination of 18.1, 18.2, and 18.3. There's one of the, the earlier um, high polyunsaturated fat calcium salts. So if we look at the fractional bio passage rate using pool and flux model, we see pretty low numbers. So 4% for 18.1, 2% for 18.2. Again, a lot of cottonseed there, probably staying in the room in a long time. 7% for 18.3. Um, so with these lower passage rates, we expect that those fatty acids are stuck in the rumen for a while. That makes a lot of time for them to become available and be biohydrogenated. If we look at our in vivo bolus model, looking at that 17-0 passage rate, we see something from 5 to 12% per hour. Um, uh, sorry for that odd chain fatty acid. So within this same realm, that passage rate is rather slow. Biohydrogenation rate is rather high. When we put this together for, for this uh, pool and flux model, um, the extent of biohydrogenation we saw there was 70% for oleic acid, 80, mid 80s for 18.2, low 80s for 18.3. So, so um, again, seeing that oleic acid was a little bit lower than 18.2 and 18.3 biohydrogenation. Uh, can we use milk 18.1 as an indicator of cis 18.1 escape? Uh, so this is really tempting because in the abmasal infusion studies, we see about 50% transfer of unsaturated fatty acids um, from, from that are infused into, into milk. The, so this would work for 18.2 and 18.3. It doesn't work for 18.1 because we have the desaturase enzyme in the mammary gland that's really active and converts over 50% of the steric acid to oleic acid. So the oleic acid in milk, we do not know if it came from absorbed oleic acid or if it came from steric acid that was converted to oleic acid. The other thing is the desaturase enzymes very responsive to nutrition, um, energy balance, milk fat depression have very, very big impacts. So we can't even assume that the desaturase enzyme activity is, is uh, similar. So that that's not going to you can kind of look there, but you better be really, really careful with your interpretation. So I wanted to look through a, a little bit of the data and, and just show you the data that's out there. And, and then, then you can get for a feel for yourself on uh, how variable the numbers are and what the ballpark of, of these numbers are for our, our calcium salt um, um, if, duodenal flows. So a first experiment uh, had a low fat control. So that had 74 grams per day of 18.1 and 111 grams of 18.2 flowing to the duodenum. So give you an idea of, of without any supplementation, where are you at? You They fed a calcium salt of high oleic sunflower oil. It increased oleic acid intake, 448 grams, increased duodenal flow, 32 grams. Biohydrogenation of oleic acid on that diet was 84%. The additional oleic acid provided, we are calculated 93% biohydrogenation. 
Calcium salt of a high 18.2 safflower increased 18.2-310 grams. Increased duodenal flow, 28 grams. Total diet biohydrogenation was 83%. The additional that was provided was 91% biohydrogenated. Just a quick summary of the other literature that 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 uh, is on my mind when I'm thinking about this. Lundy 2004 looked at soybean oil versus a calcium salt blend. This is a blend of 18.1 and uh, soybean oil, 18.2, 18.3 in there. So they increased oleic acid intake, 29 grams, increased 12 grams per day of oleic acid going to the omasum. That's 57% uh, biohydrogenation and the additional oleic acid. Uh, another experiment in 97, calcium salt of palm fatty acid and rapeseed. They increased oleic acid 160 and 208 grams per day. Um, the biohydrogenation of the oleic acid uh, was 72% and 84% in that experiment. Uh, Wu, 1991, they had low and high calcium salts, increased intake 165 and 292 grams per day. Uh, Biohydrogenation, the additional oleic acid was 59% and 61%. So this gives you an idea of some, some of the variation there. Uh, another experiment, TICE in 94, fed a calcium salt. They did not have a no calcium salt control. They're all fat supplements compared in the study. Total diet 18-1 intake was 240 grams per day. Uh, total uh, diet 18-1 biohydrogenation there was 49%. Uh, there's a couple other experiments out there that in the older literature, their, their columns were not separating uh, oleic acid, cis 9 from trans fatty acids, and they're reporting a total 18-1. Uh, so that's not really very in, insightful for getting at this, this question. So I'd say, you know, this gives you some numbers to, to look at. Um, and, and they're variable. This, this is a challenging technique. Uh, the other thing I would just say is that a lot of these experiments were done with um, unique fatty acid blends that were really trying to increase oleic acid using very high oleic acids, acid products. And um, you know they, they may not exactly be the same product and the same processing that's available right now, but this is the literature, literature that we, we have. Okay, to wrap this up and summarize, to maximize milk fat, we need to deliver fatty acids in intestine without disruption of rumen biohydrogenation or fiber digestion. Genetic potential is increased, so we need to keep up to those cows, accurately and precisely set your goals, know if you're meeting potential. Rumen biohydrogenation is very rapid, so the rate of availability of fatty acids in rumen is likely the key factor. Um, and, and this is going to vary between those feeds, right? So cotton seed, it's in that, that seed, it's slowly released, but it's not protected. It doesn't escape the rumen. Uh, calcium salts, it slows the release, but you can see we, we um, uh, can increase flows, but, but it, the, the protection is variable and, and you've, you've seen the numbers there. Um, models do not predict rumen fatty acid outflow well, and there's limited data uh, but we need to be thinking about room and outflow when balancing the diets, right? So I really, really want us to get to the point where we're talking about just like our methionine, how many grams of absorbed methionine do I have? Um, we want to be thinking about grams of absorbed fat, grams of absorption of each fatty acid, and then you can be setting your targets depending on what your goals are. Okay, I need to recognize folks in the lab that do do all the hard work, and we've also benefited greatly from funding both from USDA and also a number of industry and commodity board sponsors. Thank you, and I will look forward to questions. <laughs>